Hi guys, this is Piers Ridyard, CEO of Radix, and today I'm going to be talking a little about, bit about the idea of DeFi and what it is. Um, I, I think that there's lots of ways in which people think about what decentralized finance is, and I'm just going to drive into at least some of the concepts that make up decentralized finance and how that differs from just finance or, or what lots of people like to call centralized finance or CeFi. So DeFi is a idea that's actually younger than the, uh, than the applications that a lot of people call um, DeFi. One of the earliest DeFi applications was a, is a project called MakerDAO, um, which came out actually sort of very soon after Ethereum was created um, and is a way of creating a decentralized stablecoin. Now, Decentralized finance um, is what people are using as a term to basically describe what I would call trustless programmatic finance. This idea that you can have a set of, of computer programs um, that exist on top of a public ledger. In a, on 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 a running as a decentralized process or a partially decentralized process that allows you to interact with them with them without having to ask for someone's permission. So, for example, with MakerDAO, you can create these things called vaults, um, which create these the the these contracts in them called collateralized debt positions and basically what you do is you take some ethereum and you send it into this this makerdao uh program and makerdao then will spit out this thing called dai which is a decentralized stable coin which is pegged to the dollar so one die equals approximately one dollar. Uh, and they use a set of oracles to track the price of the dollar versus, uh, versus well, just the price of the dollar. Um, and this die, then, then you can go and spend within the Ethereum ecosystem and more and more in other places as well. Um, but the reason it's decentralized is because I haven't actually given the collateral, the Ethereum that I put into the contract, the ETH I put into the contract, I haven't actually given to a company. Like I normally when I go and take a loan, let's say I take a loan for a, a house, I will go into a bank and I will I will sign the rights over to my house to the bank, to the company that is the bank. And they will hold that in lieu of me repaying the loan. So they give me a big loan against my house that allows me to then slowly pay them back over a period of time. Um, and that that collateral is being held um, by a, a central party like the bank. Now, most people trust banks that don't exist inside crypto. I, obviously, in crypto, there's less of a trust for banks. But generally speaking, most people trust that the bank isn't going to go and, and steal their home. Obviously, there have been plenty of examples where that has not been true. But by and large, um, that is that is the process that you have to go by. And that's why banks are highly regulated and sit in this sort of highly trusted position in society. Now, what decentralized finance holds the promise of is this ability to create a contract of value against not a company, not someone where I go, I have to trust this person not to run away with my money or my collateral or whatever, but against a computer program that operates in a way that is predictable. So for example, with MakerDAO, I know because the contracts are open source and they're available to be looked through and lots of people are doing the same thing. I know that if I send my ETH into MakerDAO, I will get this thing out called a die. And this die will have a market traded value of approximately a dollar. And if I want to go and get my ETH back out of my collateralized debt position contract, I don't have to go to a, a manager and convince them that, I, to, that I'm going to pay them back or that I have paid them back and that they should now give me back my collateral. It's completely automatic. If I take out a, a loan of $10,000 or 10,000 die against some Ethereum of worth $20,000. If I come back and pay it back with interest directly into the contract, immediately out comes my Ethereum again. 
Now, that project, MakerDAO, stood on its own for a very long time. And it wasn't until some more projects started coming along that the power of DeFi started to be more than just, well, you know, who cares, really? Because it's it's more difficult for me to get Ethereum at the moment than it is to get a loan from a bank. It's more difficult for me to interact with these things called smart contracts. And I need to have MetaMask and I have to have all of these complicated extra bits and pieces which are alien to me as a, as a non-crypto user. It was only when there started to be these ways in which you could use DAI for more than just having a stable value currency that you could go into if you thought that Ethereum was going to go volatile for a while or that you wanted to hedge against Bitcoin or something like that. It started to be a exchange currency or a settlement currency for other things. A really great example and a very popular example is, is Uniswap. And Uniswap is another category of decentralized finance project. It doesn't require any trusted intermediary. It doesn't require an exchange. And it doesn't even require professional market makers, which normally categorize what's necessary to get liquidity on an exchange. It allows people to just provide assets uh, in, in normally, you know, one, one stable pair and one, one stable asset and one uh, exchange asset like let's say DAI and ETH into the continuous function market maker of Uniswap and suddenly I have exchange that can be done at very, very high volume and very, very quickly, but also trustlessly. Like I don't need to go and do a onboarding process to be able to use these applications that exist on Ledger. I can now go from MakerDAO, so I've got some ETH, I can go from MakerDAO, I can get some DAI, and then I can go and buy other tokens on top of on top of Uniswap that, that, that um, I can access instantly. As soon as I have this DAI, I can go and buy these other tokens. And this idea of exchanging and borrowing and collateralization and reformation of one asset for another sort of sits at the heart of what is making decentralized finance special and interesting. Because it's more than just the idea of not having to trust a counterparty. It's the idea of suddenly you have this massive interoperability layer that you can move assets seamlessly between. So if you think about the concept of um, a centralized exchange, let's take the London Stock Exchange, and then let's take the Shanghai Stock Exchange. And if I wanted to go, right, on the London Stock Exchange, I have some shares of company X. And on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, I, have some, I, ha I want some shares of company Y. Right now, today, if I wanted to go right to either Shanghai or London Stock Exchange, I would like company Y. I'm going to swap for company X. Can you do that for me? The answer would be no. I would have to go and sell company X, get the cash out from it. That would probably be a settlement time of three days. I would then have to transfer the money to a account that would allow me to deposit it in the Shanghai Stock Exchange or with a broker that works with the Shanghai Stock Exchange and then be able to trade on that exchange. Like these, I, these current financial systems, whilst they're very liquid and, and very well established, they also don't really have any concept of programmability or cross-functionality. Like these are islands that exist in the world that are completely unconnected. And the only way of connecting them is this really crappy system that we call the international banking system that is fundamentally incapable of sending decent, as in large amounts of money efficiently around many parts of it. Like it works okay within Europe. It works okay within America, although the American banking system is also atrocious. Like the American banking system uses checks as a way of sending money more frequently than wires because sending a piece of paper in the post for some reason is more cost effective than sending a bank transfer from one bank in one state to another bank in another state, which genuinely boggles my mind. Anyway, tangent. In decentralized finance, what you have is this public ledger 
that is your interoperability layer for money and for assets. And you have these programs that are able to take assets of one type and turn them into something else. So take Ethereum and turn it into a stable coin or take uh, Ethereum and turn it into um, a, a, another asset on Uniswap or take uh, Ethereum and turn it into a loan on Aave or Compound. All of these functions are not just more trustless in that I can kind of just interact with them without having to do like very long, very long and and boring and difficult and pain in the ass um, uh, processes to actually get accounts to be able to do it in the first place. But also money moves so much quicker. And this is where these concepts of, of liquidity mining and liquidity as a as a as a as a as a as a true um, empowerer of the ecosystem has really come to bear is this idea that now I can not only stitch together all these applications but any assets that come into the ecosystem are now able to also be part of enabling the ecosystem to do more and more transactions, more and more volume, more and more value. And so suddenly providing liquidity to Uniswap as a community member, not only do I get to uh, add my, my va like make money from providing liquidity to the ecosystem, but I'm also making the ecosystem able to conduct more transactions as well, because the more assets that are provided towards liquidity, the more smoothly and seamlessly and cost effectively the entire system what runs apart from transactions. Um, this is sort of where it all falls down, at least with with Ethereum at the moment, and and sort of um, the the DeFi ecosystem. This is why Ethereum is so expensive to use today, because there's all of this incredible promise that has sort of flown into the DeFi ecosystem. But <clears throat> the infrastructure that's been built on Ethereum fundamentally isn't designed to to work at this scale. Um, and so it's groaning. Uh, we have all of this promise of all of these billions that's coming in and being used by these applications. And we're seeing transaction costs of, you know, 60, 70, 90, 120, $150 at some of the worst times on top of this infrastructure. And so we built Radix. Um, I mean, we've been building Radix for a very long time. And we built Radix from fundamental principles of how do you create a, a, a public ledger that is able to scale to a very high degree, but also able to scale the applications that sit on top of it. And very importantly, scale the communicative, the, the communicate, the way how easily these applications can communicate and work together. And this is where Radix being built to be the first layer one protocol to serve DeFi, the, 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 the decentralized finance protocol is really important because we have fundamentally been thinking about, right, the, the genius here of decentralized finance is this ability to stitch together applications, multiple applications, not to have these little islands like we have in the London Stock Exchange and the, and the Shanghai Stock Exchange, but to have this fundamentally interoperable bunch of financial applications that you want to be able to work together instantly. And to do that, not only do you have to design a platform, a ledger for transaction scalability, you have to s design a ledger around application scalability and how you make that work specifically for decentralized finance. And a key part of this is this concept of atomic composability. Atomic composability is this idea that if, if A happens and B happens, great. But if A doesn't happen, I don't want B to happen. And if B doesn't happen, I don't want A to happen. The, the example that's always given about this is the, is the train ticket and hotel example, where I want to book a train ticket to Amsterdam from London, um, but I only want to book it if I can also book a hotel. And if uh, my train ticket succeeds, but my hotel fails, I don't want to actually end up with the train ticket. And if my hotel succeeds, but my train fails, I don't want to end up with the hotel. Now, the same thing happens on DeFi all of the time. 
flash loans is a great example of this this ability to be able to borrow out of a out of a uh, a, a, a application like uh, Aave, which allows you to borrow assets. So let's say I've borrowed some wrapped BTC because I can see that there's this opportunity on Uniswap to sell some wrapped BTC for for some Ethereum. And then I can take that Ethereum and I can go and lend it back to Aave to be able to get out some other collateral to be able to pay back my wrapped BTC loan in the first place. But I don't want to end up with the wrapped BTC if the opportunity to purchase from Uniswap at that particular rate disappears because then what I'll end up, I'll end up with is a wrapped BTC loan but not actually have succeeded in completing the circle in my arbitrage trade. Now, while that sounds really esoteric and really niche, it's exactly trades like that that are happening within a single block Right? Not waiting for block confirmations, not waiting for like multiple blocks to continue, but within a single block operation where I'm calling multiple applications at the same time. That is one of the things that is driving the billions in liquidity that is occurring between all of these different applications. Because fundamentally, it's the arbitrage that's keeping the price at the right level that's making sure that if there is you know a price dis disparity between what's happening on Binance and what's happening on Uniswap that someone can take come and take advantage of that and bring those prices into the right level which means that consumers and users don't don't miss out don't lose out on that on 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 well I used Uniswap and the price was way off what it was supposed to be on Binance so I should have just used Binance like these kind of arbitrage these kind of fundamental ways in which you can move Move assets and value between these applications that exist on top of these public ledgers is the binding, is the is the magic that makes DeFi so so liquid and means that it's part of the reason it means it's growing so quickly. Yes, there's things like uh, liquidity mining and, and, and high AP, uh, APRs and things like that. But fundamentally, what drives every single financial market is the underlying liquidity of it. And this is what brings it together. And this is what's at jeopardy. That this is this is what is broken by Ethereum 2.0 and the way they shard, and what is broken by uh, Avalanche and how they shard with their subnets, or Polkadot and how they shard with their with their um, subchains, and 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 broken with Cosmos. And so, this is this is the thing that at Radix we realized fundamentally had to be delivered to make sure that we could live up to the promise of being the first layer one specifically designed to uh, service DeFi. And if you want to understand more about our consensus allows you to stitch together applications across multiple shards, then please do watch my other video on uh, Radix uh, consensus and uh, what, I, what is often referred to as the trilemma. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this was interesting. Please do leave a comment and smash the like button. And if you want something else for me to be talking about one of these videos, just tweet me on Twitter. You can find me at Piers Ridyard on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching.